Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. This is Jess, and I am here with an OG of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Now, I consider Taylor Armstrong's story, which played out over the first three seasons of Beverly Hills, to be one of, if not the most impactful stories to be shared on Housewives across the board. Taylor is very open about her story, which includes themes of domestic abuse and the eventual suicide of her husband, Russell Armstrong. I'm also very interested in her take on why she thinks housewives continue to go on these shows with major skeletons in their closet. I'm talking the modern day Erica Jane and Jen Shaw. Please welcome Taylor Armstrong. Hi there. How are you? Thank you for having me. Of course. How are you today? I'm great. I'm doing really well. Thank what, you for asking. What's been going on? Are you still in Orange County? I am in Orange County and things are great. I got remarried Four four fourteen. So we just celebrated another wedding anniversary, and my daughter's doing great. She's fifteen now, which is so hard for me to believe, and I just can't believe how fast these years have gone. But everyone's healthy and happy, and I'm really blessed and thankful. Where in the OC do you live? I live in San Clemente, oh. which is the last city before you go to San Diego County. Got it. Okay, and like, do you know? any of the OC housewives? Yes, I do. Um, I see Kelly Dodd on occasion. I've known Vicky for a really long time. Gretchen, Mm -hmm. Tamara and I know each other a little. She's really good friends with one of my friends. And who else is still around? Like Um, Shannon? No, I've met her, but I don't know her well. We met at a charity event for Paul Nassif a long time ago. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. And I know that at one point you were living in Colorado, but what was your trajectory to get to L.A. slash Beverly Hills, like originally? Well, it was a long journey, but I grew up in Oklahoma in Tulsa and I moved for work after I went to OU and then I moved and worked in like the Chicago area. And then I went and worked in Dallas. So I kind of moved around. And then eventually I bought a textile company in Beverly. It was in Los Angeles. And my parents lived in Southern California as well. So I wanted to be a little closer to them. I'm an only child. And so I bought this textile company in the garment district in downtown LA and I moved to Beverly Hills. And oh, so it was the textile company that brought you back essentially back to your family to LA and Beverly Hills. Why do you prefer living in Orange County over Los Angeles at this point? Living in LA is really fun when you're young and you're out all the time. And I used to like to go to Hollywood and and do all those kinds of things. And I think I've become a little bit less tolerant of the traffic and all of the things that come with living in such a huge city, just the complications of getting around. And, you know, when you want to go from Malibu to Beverly Hills, you know, you need to expect to be in a lot of traffic and things have changed a lot in LA, you know, especially through the pandemic. It's a little sad to go up there at this point. How big a part of you identifies with the Bravo or television or the housewives anymore? I will always identify my life in relationship to what I've done on reality television. I, I still get stopped a lot from people and they, they want to share their stories with me about having an abusive history, or they want to ask me questions about the show. Um, ran into a woman yesterday who just said, Oh, I think about you often. And I'm just so happy to see you out. And I thought it was really sweet. I was in a restaurant, but I thought, Oh, do people not know that I've been out all these years? (laughs) I don't want people to think I crawled into some hole because of what I went through and I haven't been able to recover, you know. So when we did our wedding special, um, John and myself with David Tutera, I felt like that was a good opportunity for people to see that there is life after and that I wasn't just like in a ball in a corner somewhere. (laughs) Like was BravoCon something... Well, I guess like I, I'm, sh- I'm sure you're aware that there was this BravoCon thing in New York City a few years ago. Was that something that seemed interesting to you or you have you like really left it behind? I'm bringing up BravoCon because of your original cast, Adrian Malouf and Kim Richards, who really have distanced themselves 
a little bit from the franchise, they were there, like on stage, like at an OG panel. Would that have been something of interest to you or not really? Still is definitely a part of something I identify with. And um, I would sit on a panel or let people ask me questions about it. Um, It doesn't, it's not something I'm trying to escape from or get away from. In terms of like the current cast, aren't you a little friendly with uh, Lisa Rinna? I do love Lisa Renna. Yeah. Like, I don't get to see the girls all that much because everyone thinks, oh, Orange County to Beverly Hills. It's a little bit more of a trajectory that you have to plan out, you know, like get invited to go to events. But and it's just like, okay, I really want to go see everyone. But that's like a full day's commitment. It's It's not like a hotel. And, you know, it's different than just popping over to have dinner with someone. So I don't see them nearly as much as I would like. But we communicate, you know, somebody will put a picture out into the world and we'll either somebody will tweet it and then one of us will DM each other or and when the meme came out, Kyle and I. We're just back and forth all the time on just how funny everything was around the meme. And so we communicate in those ways. I feel like with the core group of us, we could all get back together tomorrow and it would have been like we didn't miss a beat. Oh, wow. I I would really love to go through the entire process of how were you discovered for Housewives? Like, where did it begin for you? Adrian and I have been friends the longest um, as far as my relationships go. And she and I were in mommy and me together. So we were together a lot when our kids were really, really little. Yeah. Our kids went to a preschool together in Beverly Hills and she and I would, once they didn't need mommy at mommy and me anymore, when they got to be a little bit older, we would go to coffee every day while the kids would be at preschool. And we really spent a lot of time together. So when they were casting for housewives, they saw, you know, Beverly Hills is a small town in the middle of a big city. It really is. And everyone knows everyone, especially if you're someone that's involved in a lot of charities and that type of work. So when they started interviewing people, my name came up in a few different circles and Adrian was interviewing and she mentioned me. So eventually I went in and we did a reel and the rest is kind of history. <laughs> like, do you know how your name, aside from Adrian, do you know how your name came up? Like in what circles? You know, I don't know. They just told me that they'd heard my name mentioned a few times. And I think they were reaching out to some like hairdressers and some people in that world. And I think my hairdresser mentioned my name at the time, um, but I'm not sure who else. I just know that there were five of us originally um, that they were choosing between some different friend groups and the five of us, it was Camille was not involved yet. And so once Mm. they had selected or narrowed it down to the five of us, then Kyle ran into Camille at a party and mentioned it to her. And then they brought Camille on. So we ended up being a total of six. It's so funny that you mentioned the hairdresser connection. (laughs) That's how they cast Jersey as well. They literally would go into hair salons in these different pockets of Jersey. That's how they found Teresa and Dolores literally was just going into hair salons and like listening to the women talk. I can a hundred percent believe it. The stuff that goes down in hair salons should be its own show. It probably is. I just don't know it. (laughs) Well, it it, it actually on Bravo, like sheer genius Tabitha. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah. I can see why. I mean, the things you divulge when you're in that hairdresser's chair all day is uh, can be substantial at times. So, so you knew Kyle and Adrian. Did you know Lisa Vanderpump? I did not. Um, Lisa and I had been at some events that Adrian had hosted prior, but not, we didn't know one another. And um, I had met Kyle a few times and she and I always had a, a really great relationship. And there's so much that happens when the cameras aren't rolling, so many fun things and so many laughs. And I wish that it was better for ratings to see us all having fun together more than just the drama because it does exist. I mean, you you would think, why would you be friends with these people if you were just Mm -hmm. watching all the trauma and drama? And the truth of the matter is we used to have a lot of fun. I guess at the time, even casting was beginning to happen for Beverly Hills. OC, New York and Atlanta were all, I believe, on the air. So by the time it hit Beverly Hills, I would presume that a lot of people inside of Hollywood were trying out, quote unquote, 
for the show. Yeah, they had thousands of people try out for Beverly Hills. And it was interesting because um, Bravo really kind of fought the idea for lack of a better term, they they fought the idea of doing Beverly Hills because they're all in New York and their perception was that Beverly Hills is exactly the same as Orange County. And it took them a really long time to finally accept that there might be something different about the two. Kind of like how they accepted that Jersey is an entirely different breed from New York. A hundred percent. You're right about that. Now, with with the thousands of people who were trying out, were these like Hollywood types? Like what types of people were going out for the show? On the scale, actual housewife to like actress, because I know Rinna, she had interest in the show from an earlier point than she actually joined. Like what were the types of people who were trying out? I think in the beginning they were, it was such a diverse group. I knew I had a lot of friends that were trying out that were, housewives, you know, socialite types. And then I definitely knew of some younger girls who were more actresses um, who were trying out. And I think maybe some of the hesitation in the beginning about bringing on actresses was that they made it harder to believe reality if you have someone who has the ability to act. You know, I think maybe they were a little hesitant at the beginning of that, that it would look more like a scripted show. But I think it's worked out. I mean, over time with Eileen and and Rena, it I think it rings still rings very real. Did it surprise you that a Denise Richards, this woman was a movie star, you know, in the nineties. Did it surprise like what was your reaction when she joined the cast? I was pretty surprised when Denise joined the cast. Um, I've only been around Denise uh a small amount and she's very sweet and I just thought well, she's way too sweet to be on this show like I wasn't sure if she would be able to handle having that much invasion of her life when she's used to being someone as you said who chooses to do an interview about a movie or a television show it's not necessarily about her life and I was curious to see how that would all play out for her do you remember like when you first heard Rina's name like thrown in the mix? Like was it was her name being thrown around from the jump? I believe Rina's name was there from the beginning. If not season one, I do remember in season two that it had come up. And were you like watch like had you watched OC and New York? Like going into this, did you know what you were getting into? <laughs> I had seen some of the shows before and I thought I had an idea of what I was getting myself into, but until you've experienced reality TV from our perspective, I don't think you ever know what you're really getting into. There was a, a belief in my mind that you kind of got to tell what reality you really wanted to tell. And once the cameras are rolling and mics are on, it certainly is not the case. You don't get to filter your reality. (laughs) Can you talk about how, the production style evolved from your first season to, you know, the second and the third? Like, did you notice anything from your perspective of the way the show was either being shot or the direction you were given from producers? In the beginning, um, just the nature of the six of us and women in general, I think we would spend a lot of time, like go to a dinner and we'd be talking about our kids or our charities or all the things that normal people talk about. And we would have these marathon dinners because they were really getting no content that was usable. You know, it just wasn't interesting hearing about each other showing pictures of our kids or whatever. And so those kind of normal behaviors, I feel like we learned what we needed for content and that if we got the content out there and um, we got it done, then we could enjoy our time with one another. (laughs) So it came, and this is just from my perspective, but it came from us having these marathon dinners with no usable content to, okay, I'm going to go fight with Camille and then we're all going to go do something, you know, and just knowing that they need the story needs to be told and us just sitting around talking about each other's hair isn't going to make the ratings. <laughs> there, When I think of Kyle, sometimes I associate 
her a little bit with Jill Zarin from New York in the sense that they both have spoken uh, quite a bit about the anxiety and the emo- the emotional side that cast members go through while filming a season. Like Kyle's been really vocal about how anxious she can get. It's the re- Jill Zarin. Like I've interviewed Jill Zarin a few times, and I've listened to her talk about this, saying that she doesn't know if she could handle it again. Just like the like she feels it. Like in when you're in the room and you're having these arguments, it would stay with her and really get into her head. What was your experience like as far as anxiety and emotions? I absolutely identify with Kyle and Jill's opinions about the anxiety really staying with you and being in that moment. Um, One challenge that I had amongst many is that I didn't have any support in my home life. So I would be all amped up and stressed out with the girls when things were going rough. And then I would go home to such a tumultuous home life. And so it wasn't like I would have given anything to have Kyle and Lisa's situation where they have this awesome support system at home through their husbands and their families. And they can kind of brush off the anxiety of the day by having someone there to support them. And I think that I carried it even more with me because I didn't have that backup or that ability to not be stressed out at home and be stressed out at filming. On that note, what did Russell Armstrong, what did he think of you doing the show? He was excited about me doing the show. He was very narcissistic. And I think it was his perception that he was going to be beloved and that you would only see the best side of him. Um, Clearly, he did not go into it realizing that everything about our real life was going to come out on television. And I think that he just thought it was going to be some fun experience and he was going to get some exposure and he was going to come out looking great. Why did you do the show? Sometimes I think about whether I did the show subconsciously. I mean, I can just say off the off the front, I did the show because I thought it'd be fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just some new experience. And then But I think maybe in the back of my mind, Russell could be good. He could be great at times. And then he could be really horrible. And people don't act out in public. And they certainly aren't going to act out in front of a camera. So part of it, I think subconsciously, I was hoping that having that exposure and Mm -hmm. the cameras around were going to help him to stay in the good lane and maybe provide some control and some protection for me. I know present day, the network and producers, they tell all prospective housewives who are about to film their first season, if you have any skeletons in your closet, they will all come out. And I tell people the same. <laughs> and it's interesting I mean, there's a lot we could go down a whole psychological analysis of this, why there are some, I mean, I guess Russell really would be, well, maybe he wasn't told, but did they, well, I guess, did they tell you that at the beginning? Well, the contracts are pretty, pretty, the contracts are pretty specific that everything about your life is fair game. So I think I was aware of it to some extent, but I thought I could do a better job of hiding my reality Mm -hmm. and that I could put my best foot forward. And when he was on camera with me, that it would look like we've got this fairy tale marriage. Cause I was really good at faking that anyway, and mm-hmm. thought he would just do the same. But it was, it was very interesting to me because when I first started watching season one, I could see the awkward relationship that we had from the outside. It was mm-hmm. really telling to me to see us together and to see how he would watch me out of the corner of his eye or you could just tell that he was it just was such an unhealthy marriage and it was really strange to see from a viewer perspective one last thing on the idea of like skeletons in the closet are, are you following the news with regarding like erica and tom girardi and even this news with this salt lake city housewife these federal charges i mean essentially these are actual crimes i mean in the case of one of them they're basically a ringleader of an entire ponzi scheme 
any insight as to why somebody would think this would not come out? I was definitely surprised to hear that someone, I'll use the Salt Lake City example, someone who was that deep into criminal activity would take the risk of going on the show. But I think it goes to there's a level of narcissism when you have gotten away with this for so long and on so many layers that you just think that you're impervious to anyone figuring out that they might be a little bit smarter than you than you are. (laughs) Right. Yeah, no, very, very well said. Um, You you know, like I I told you earlier, I read your book, uh, it's called Hiding from Reality. And if you are open to it, I'm very curious to hear how it was filming this show while you were going through this insane, deadly serious home life situation. So I mean, obviously, you were trying to keep the abuse from the cameras, and a lot of your energy was going toward that. Were Was this known to people in your personal life at all? Like you like, I'm thinking your parents, your really close friends. There was a lot of rumbling before I ever did Housewives about our relationship. And there's just some behaviors that would come out, you know, if we were at a charity event or some public event, and it would be clear to people that there was something going on between us. And when it came to the show, I thought that he would behave all the time, which was going to benefit me. But trying to keep all of that under wraps, not only keeping him under control and trying to keep the lid on that pot, So trying to keep the lid on the pot of who Russell was, trying to keep him under control at home on top of the anxiety and all the fighting and the stress of filming the show. I really don't know how I kept it together, except that I was the complete mess all the time. And I ended up becoming really, really thin. And people would constantly say in the tabloids that I was anorexic, which wasn't the case. I was just a mess. And it was like I was eating myself up inside from the constant stress. How did you initially meet Russell Armstrong? I met Russell at the Four Seasons. I was waiting for a friend in the restaurant area. And he was um, with a big group and they were waiting for their table to be sat. And I was just sitting there waiting and his friend started talking to me. And then he and I talked for a little bit and went out on a date. <laughs> and what what was that first date like? Well, I read flags early on in our relationship that when I tell my story, when I'm doing public speaking and sharing my story, I'm fast that I wasn't more aware of the red flags that were there from day one. Uh, we went on a date and the jealousy was already on the first date he um, I said hello to the waiter because I, it was a restaurant that I frequented. And by the end of dinner, he had me in tears because he was convinced that I was having a relationship with this waiter whom I'd never even seen outside the restaurant, but he was just insistent and basically calling me a whore and everything else. Because now apparently I just have random sex with people that work in the restaurants I go to is, was his whole story, but something about his, it, that was a constant tendency for him to create these stories in his mind that were completely unfathomable and untrue and then never let it go. He would just hold on to his belief that there was something going on that he didn't know about. And his jealousy would just go into these crazy stories and then eventually into rage. And he would convince himself so thoroughly that these intricate stories were true that it almost, I would defend myself, but it was almost so ridiculous. I could never talk him out of his belief. Why did, so why did you go on a second date? Like, what was the attraction? I was definitely attracted to him and he was very charismatic, which is the case a lot of the time with abusers. And I chalked it up to just like a bad night, the first Mm -hmm. night and thought things would be different once he got to know me. Like, oh, once he sees, I don't have, I don't have a flirtatious bone in my body. It's just not who I am. I mean, a lot of my friends are adorable and love to flirt. It's just not who I am. And I thought, okay, it hasn't been around me. So once he sees that I'm not flirtatious, then it's going to make it better. So I kind of, I believe I just thought 
it would change, which is so cliche because that's what everyone says who sees red flags. And it's hard for me to hear myself say all the red flags I saw and all the things I put up with. And when I do public speaking, I hear myself telling these stories and it feels like I'm telling a story about someone else that has nothing to do with me because it's so unfathomable to me that I would have allowed all of these things to happen and for it to just continually get worse and me not do anything about it, just keep thinking it's going to get better or whatever I had convinced myself of. But It now feels like an out-of-body experience to share those stories because it seems so ridiculous. And is it still like the the charm? And I guess, you know, obviously you, you know, you were in, in love with him to some extent. You married him and you had a child. Is it the same answer as far as like what kept you in the marriage? By the time I could tell that things were much worse than I had initially thought, um, I was already pregnant with Kennedy. So that took that option for me off the table of just walking away. It definitely kept me there and trying to figure out how to have a positive relationship and a strong family unit for my child. You know, the fear of thinking about sharing custody with someone who has major anger management issues, it felt better for me to stay and tolerate it myself rather than risking having to send my little girl off with someone who cannot control themselves. Mm -hmm. Once the show aired, now the public was bearing witness to this, in addition to the cast, and now like there was rumblings of, you know, becoming a storyline and really being spoken about. Was Russell scared at all that he would be arrested? I mean, particularly once you started showing up with physical signs of abuse? In the beginning, I feel that Russell thought that he was going to be beloved on the show and that he could use that charismatic side of his and it would all be behind the scenes and no one would ever know. Um, In season two, when, well, I'll go back. In season one, there was a tabloid article that came out and it said something about us not having a good marriage. And he was pretty angry about that whole thing. Um, And then it sort of went away a little. I did Wendy Williams in season one. And at one point during the interview, she said, he abuses you, doesn't he? And I don't remember the response because I think I was so in shock, but I, I I think that I just kind of laughed when (laughs) no, like, and and was dying inside. Um, but she was the first one that called it out. And I was terrified I was going to listen to this interview and it was going to be a huge problem. Um, I didn't admit to anything, of course. And then did the in pre- season at two. That, at that time, did the press pick up on that Wendy Williams appearance at all? I don't remember any specific articles coming out after the Wendy Williams appearance, but there were definitely rumblings in the background. They weren't at the forefront yet of people saying that, there's something wrong with their relationship. And when I would watch the episodes, I could see that it was really obvious, much more so than I thought. And I had a feeling that things were going to continue to snowball. And then in season two, when Camille at the tea party at Lisa's, she said, we don't say he hits you. And that's when I knew that everything in my life was about to change. And I remember just looking at our producer, the minute Camille said that and thinking, I was just stunned. I didn't know what to do. And I was looking at him and I remember thinking everything is going to change in my life from this moment on. Like as soon as this cat gets out of the bag, I'm either going to get killed or things are going to get better or they're going to get a lot worse. I I have so many questions that I want to ask about this specific incident. First off, are you aware the new light in which that scene was shown a few it was Lisa Vanderpump's last season they actually flashed back and played that scene again in the context it was being used as evidence they were breaking the fourth wall proving that it was Lisa Vanderpump who instructed Camille to bring it up on camera were you aware of that I was not aware of that and I don't know if it was determined whether that was true or not no, no, it was. It's, it's, on, it's on camera. Like you see, oh. you, uh, yeah, what you see is 
they pan back and now you're seeing like cameramen producers and you okay. see camille really sort of freaked out that she said that and she walks over to vanderpump and says why did you make me say that and you see vanderpump going like i did sort of, but like she said you know it's all right there the evidence and this was used to further a different storyline that was happening in present day um i guess the real the real question is how did lisa and or camille know the truth of what was happening like had you confide in one of them privately I met with Camille. She and I had lunch out in Malibu off camera. She was going through her divorce and I was contemplating what I was going to do in my situation. And I wanted to get her advice on she's going through a divorce with someone who clearly has extensive means in Kelsey. And Russell used to threaten me that if I tried to leave, he would drag me through the court system, bankrupt me, that he had so many superior financial opportunities that I would never be able to crawl out from under it. And so I wanted to talk to Camille and just see how all that was shaking out with custody. And if there was a huge disparity because of financial means. And so she and I had lunch and I shared some things with her that were going on in my life um, about the abuse and I just wanted to find out what my options were at that point and how she was handling things. Um, and so I did confide in her. You guys probably know that I'm super into health and fitness and I've been drinking protein shakes and protein powders for years, but I finally found a better, more satisfactory way to get in my protein before and after workouts. Magic Spoon is a healthy, high-protein cereal with zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. We're talking only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. It tastes exactly like regular cereal from your childhood, but it's super nutritious. We're talking a variety pack of flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. I mean just like when you were a kid. To try it out, go to magicspoon.com slash hot takes to get a variety pack and try it today. Be sure to use the code hot takes at checkout to, to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's back with a 100% happiness to guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. Magicspoon.com slash hot takes. Use the code hot takes to save $5 off. At what point was Russell made aware that this was actually brought up on camera and was going to be part of the show? Well, so as I was in complete shock, staring at my producer after this was outed and I knew this aired, something dramatic was going to happen one way or the other. So I called my psychiatrist, Dr. Sophie, who was on a few episodes with me yeah. and oh, yeah. he had been counseling. Yeah. Dr. Sophie had been trying to help counsel us and I went and met with him and told him what had happened. And we were just trying to a plan to put it out there to some extent before he got blindsided by it, because I was afraid those consequences would be worse than if he, he had no idea. And all of a sudden it just popped up on television, but I was getting concerned because after it was outed at the tea party, um, there were a lot of people there, camera crews, sound engineers, the cast, and keeping it from the tabloids and the press was just looming over me that he was going to find out without finding out from me. When did the shit hit the fan? Like, how did he find out? So we had a counseling session with Dr. Sophie and Dr. Sophie and I told him. And what happened? Like, what was his re like, what did he do? In the actual counseling session, he was angry, but he maintained control. Um, and after that, he wrote a letter to a, a production company and one to Camille that he was going to sue them. And I wasn't aware of the Camille letter. I knew the Evolution one, uh, our production company, but I didn't read any of it. And then the whole letter to Camille sparked a whole another problem on the show, which was, you know, one of us suing the other one. And and um, it caused huge fights 
amongst the other ladies. As far as him trying to prevent Bravo from airing it, I think you kind of sign your life away that like you can't prevent something from being aired. Denise Richards wanted to prevent the whole thing last year from airing. Like you can't like you're stuck. Um, As far as when everything came to a head with with Russell, were you you were separated at that point, right? Like he was living in his own house. After he hit me the last time, um, which was on my birthday, when he fractured my orbital floor, uh, I did have him move out at that point. Can you kind of walk me through what happened as far as his death is concerned? Mm -hmm. We had been in communication regarding our divorce, and he was a completely different person after I told him I wanted a divorce and I finally stood up for myself and he was acquiescing to pretty much any demand that I had as far as our separation and custody and out of fear because he didn't want me to press charges against him. And he was highly concerned that the district attorney was going to press charges anyway, because it was such a public case. So he would always take my meetings. He would always take my phone calls and He was the nicest he's ever been to me. Um, And I went to go meet him one day to have another meeting about custody. And he wasn't in his office, which was highly unusual because he was a workaholic. And I was with him and trying to find him and calling his other business partners. Just I just had this weird feeling like something's wrong because he would have never missed a meeting with me during that really critical time. And finally, I called a friend of mine. No one had heard from him all weekend. And it was a Monday. And I a friend of mine who was a world championship kickboxer and asked him to go over to the house with me where he had moved for protection, obviously. And um, we went over and he went in the gate. And then he had, there was another guy who lived on the property. And he finally came to the gate and said he hadn't, but his car was there. So we went over to the window of his bedroom and they pried the window open and we went inside and that's when we found him hanging. Do you know why was it this day? Like what was, what was the precursor? I don't know why he chose to take his life when he did. I don't know if it was fear of him getting prosecuted or the realization of how much he had hurt me and not being able to face the consequences of that. I don't know of anything that was a true catalyst. I didn't talk to him over the weekend, so I'm not sure. There was no no alcohol or drugs or anything like that in his, in his um, toxicology. Were you just in shock? Yes, I was definitely in shock. It's all kind of a blur, but I ran from the window out into the street and my the, my friend that went with me was calling 911 and I was screaming and extremely emotional of course and um then I realized my daughter was with me. Um she and my assistant were in the car and I all of a sudden took myself out of it recognizing that I have a little girl here. So my assistant got my nanny to come and pick up my daughter and get her out of there before the fire trucks and everything came. Um, But it was definitely a bit of a blur. Did you ever feel that the show was capitalizing on your situation? I wasn't sure how much they would really air, how how much they would air if the severity got to a certain point, would that then be off limits? But at the same time, recognizing that as we spoke about, you're signing your reality away. And that was a huge part of mine. Did producers ever take you aside or try to intervene about the severity and the reality with which you were living? I know that the producers had a lot of empathy for what I was going through. Um, But at the same time, they were just documenting my reality. And it was probably a really fine line for them to figure out where they wanted to play in that. Shifting to like a lighter note, 
would you ever be interested in coming back on the show? Like, would you ever want to do something like that again? Like now, considering like your life is so different and you've come out the other side and we've seen your history. Does that interest you at all? I think it would make a powerful statement for me to go back on a show or to have my life on television again, because it is so different. And I hope that people would see it and think, wow, there really is life after tragedy. When I ended with the, with housewives, my life was in limbo pretty much. It was just kind of starting to lean towards some normalcy again. I did a wedding special with David Tutera when I got married and I felt like that was a nice way for people to see how happy I am now and what a loving relationship I have that's built on equality and friendship and all the things that everyone deserves in the world. Um, But, and I think it would be good too, because having a support system at the end of the day would have made all the difference in the world as to my interaction with the housewives back then. Has the network ever approached you aside from doing like little, you know, where are they nows and the, the watch what happens live, you know, have they approached you in the, the ensuing years about the possibility? We definitely had discussions um, about my going back at one point or maybe more than one point. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the, rea- the truth is you could even uh, if, if they somehow manage figure out a way to salvage Real Housewives of Orange County, you could actually market it to two cities. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> if they can figure out what the hell to do with that show. Right. Exactly. That's funny. Um, and I do know a lot of those girls. so It wouldn't be completely unfathomable. Yeah. <laughs> Like, are you still in touch with Lisa Vanderpump? Uh, I've had, um, I see Lisa on occasion. Not, and I, I mean, I don't get to see the girls as much as I would like. But, yeah. and, you know, LA is, has changed a lot since I left. So I don't spend as much time up there as I used to. It's, it's kind of sad what, what has happened. And it's just, it's, it feels like it's so different. I never thought I would leave LA. Like and different, now, different how? Well, I think all the, just the homeless situation and, it's hard to drive around a place that you love and just see the plight that's there. Um, I mean, we need to notice it so that we can try to do something about it. But at the same time, you know, I drive, I drove into Brentwood a few weeks ago and I was just shocked at seeing the neighborhood that is right near Bel Air where I lived forever. And I just couldn't believe that it looked the way it did. It was heartbreaking. Taylor, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, tell me, like, what are you doing now? I, I mean, I know that you're a speaker. Um, you know, I know that you were on the regular, like, speaking circuit. Is that something that you're still, like, very passionate about? Like, hel- helping victims of domestic abuse? I do a lot of public speaking. Well, I raise a lot of money for charities. I visit a lot of women's shelters and share my story. And I love speaking to college kids. I think it's such a critical time when you're finally away from your parents and from those watchful eyes when you can start making bad relationships decisions. And so being able to tell them about red flags and all the things that I did wrong and and building up self-esteem so that people make choices based on what they deserve as opposed to what they think they deserve. (laughs) I think is really important. And so colleges have been a real joy for me. And talk to me about the Taylor Armstrong Foundation. So the Taylor Armstrong Foundation is meant to help shelters at a local level. When I first started speaking and visiting a lot of shelters, I realized there's a lot of needs that are not that great, not that grand, I mean. So they might need to have part of the interior of the shelter painted. And so rather than saying, oh, we're going to just fundraiser and raise $100,000, it's can I reach out to a paint company and say, would you be willing to donate X number of gallons of paint to to clean up the inside of the shelter. So the Taylor Armstrong Foundation is focused at shelters at a local level and making differences that really allow the people that are living there to feel good about themselves. I mean, I, I'm I'm really pr- I'm proud of of everything that you've the positive that you've really been able to turn your life into, and we'll see if you ever wind back up back on the show. But just thank you for your brutal honesty and sharing your story. Like, I really do recommend your book. Where can people find you if they want to contact you, reach out? You can just go to my website at taylorarmstrong.com, and you can reach out and somebody will get back to you. And if they would like to have me speak or just 
promote a good charity, anything I can do in that realm. I am excited to be a part of it. And I have a new Women Helping Women initiative business-wise that I'm going to be coming out with in the next few weeks. And you can find that on Karma, K-A-R-M-A Jackets on Facebook, and you'll get to see what we're doing. But it's for women to have events in their own home and make some money. Awesome. Taylor, thank you so much. Thank this you. Was great. Take care, hon. This I was appreciate great. your time. Thank you. <laughs> Guys, you can follow me, JessXNYC, follow the show account, Hot Takes Deep Dives, and we'll see you soon.